Hello, everyone. It's Kathleen with Tree Sisters and our creative interviews. And today we're with Yannick Dubois. And I am so excited to share all that he is and all that he does with all of you. He um, has a, a complete story of his life is just absolutely fascinating. And we could talk and go on about him um, for days and days, probably. But we're going to try and just give you the precious glimpse into his work, his artistry, and basically his, his lifestyle that he's chosen um, living in the forest and working with the forest in all different ways that he can. I'm going to tell you hello. I'm going to say hello first to Yannick. Hello, Yannick. <laughs> hello. Thank you so much. For this introduction. Yeah, it's just, it's beautiful. You and I have talked before, um, I guess it's probably about a half a year ago already, but um, very inspiring to talk to you always and really excited to finally have an opportunity to do this interview with you. So I'm going to just read, I'm reading over here because um, I didn't want to print out and use any paper. So excuse me if I look away, everybody. But Yannick, all right, here is what a little bit about Yannick. We're going to share his website with you and all the wonderful things. And we're going to share some of his artwork in here. We'll show you right here on the screen. But here's a little bit just to start us off. So uh, Yannick, his work is done with paper, pen, ink, watercolor, photography, and Photoshop. But even as I say that, and as you will learn, it's quite a bit more than that that he uses and he tunes into. He's also a, a um, workshop facilitator around the Ogham, which we're going to talk about, the Celtic Ogham. That's the, um, the focus, of, the main focus of his work. He lives near Totnes in Devon, southwest of in the southwest part of England. His, uh, the name of his website is Forest Heart, which I, I don't usually say the name out loud. I usually just put the link, but I love that name so much. So I wanted to say Forest Heart out loud. And um, I believe that you will feel the heart of the forest in this conversation. He's going to have, a, he will, he currently is running Tree Wisdom online workshops, and those are about the Ago. The next one will be starting on October 12th with the apple tree, and we'll put links to all of that goodness. And he's going to be, it's an exciting thing because he's going to be uh, running a crowd, crowdfunding campaign for his tree wisdom, a tree wisdom calendar that's going to be released in 2022. So we all get to be a part of that as well. And of course, he's a um, loyal tree brother and artist partner with us. So he is planting one tree per every tree wisdom workshop per every commissioned piece of, for every hour of commissioned artwork. And um, he's also gonna be donating for, to the trees for each of his calendars. In less than a year from all of his donations, he's planted over 2000 trees with Tree Sisters. So, so grateful to you for that. His qualifications are long and illustrious. <laughs> In 2005 to 2010, he was working in social work studies. In 2007 to 2008, he, has six, he worked six months in an NGO work in India, learning yoga and meditation. In 2009, six months of research in India for my thesis and for his thesis on yoga and education. 2010 to 14, work as an educator in kindergarten in Berlin. 2014, Forest Photography Exhibition in Berlin. 2010 to 15, Life Drawing Classes. 2015, worked as a teacher in a secondary school in Belgium. 2015 to 18, he worked as a Druid College, as a, in Druid College Apprenticeship. 
in 2015 to 18, trackways bushcraft training from a Native American lineage. And since then, since 2018, he's been in bardic training with the Order of Bards Ove Centurids. So it's an absolute pleasure. I, I just like that. I feel so full. We talked about this before we hit the record button. There is so much to your life. Um, I actually, you know, feel very touched um, by your journey. There's a lot to it. There's a lot to share. And we have a lot that we want to share about what's happening now. But your, your journey to this point has been since you were a young, a young boy. And I'm just going to mention a few of the things that kind of brought you to where you are now, but I want to let everyone know, please, please to read his bio on uh, the website that I'll show you, because it is a story of his connection and his depth of work with the forest since he was a child. So instead of just a bio that, you know, so this is what I do. Um, it's more about this journey that's unfolded as a young man until into now and, you know, a lot more to come. I in, um, was born in, in uh, Germany with uh, parents Dubois, like Claire's last name, the same last name is, is a French origin, meaning the forest. And I didn't learn that until Yannick. So that's really exciting for Claire as well, of course. And then uh, growing up as a teenager, he ex experienced wonderful things, but also a sequence of traumatic events and heartbreaks from 16 to 20. And he was looking for distraction, something to soothe his pain. And uh, through all of these things, he turned to working with children, working, in, you know, going into the forest to find connection and help to get away from other distractions that would be easing the pain in different ways. And he was diagnosed with Lyme disease in 2013. And from there, uh, things really started to deepen for him. And over a period of three years, he's been, like, like I said, tr training in Druidity and bushcraft. And there is so much to hear from him, but I want to turn it over <laughs> to the man himself. And, uh, but I do, I do ask you, I, I do suggest, please look at his story on his website. So how are you today, Yannick, right now in this moment? Uh, yeah, feeling, um, feeling great. Um, a little bit overwhelmed from being showered with so much appreciation, um, but it's beautiful to receive. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, there are lots of things you could talk about. Um, yeah, just feeling honored to be here and having this time with you. Mm, that's wonderful. So where do you want to start with all the, um, I mean, where you are right now is, is amazing. And I want to let everybody know what you're doing and what you're up to and where you just came back from and, you know, just your lifestyle. Right now you're in this beautiful yurt as we see you and, and you told me already the sun is shining and I can see it coming down from the top of the year a little bit on your, into your place. And this is where you live, right? You live in the, in the yurt. Yes, it's true. I live um, on a small farm where I help um, a little bit of uh, woodland management and gardening and helping with the animal. So uh, I've tried over the years to find a lifestyle where I can really like, live according to my values. And it's only been last year in the autumn that um, I had the idea of building a yard for myself with someone more experienced who could guide me. And uh, so this is the outcome. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be living in a home made of trees working for the trees, surrounded by trees, um, talking to you about trees. <laughs> so um, I sometimes say in a, as a joking way, but it's actually true that um, in the last two years, I've been um, full-time employed by the trees. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes people ask me, how did you get there? And uh, yeah, some of the things you already touched on, I think uh, trauma and disease and, uh, and so on were big um, uh, important gateways for me just to mention the Lyme disease is one of them where 
I remember being in my bed for two and a half to three months, um, sleeping between 14 and 16 hours of the day and not knowing if I would recover. And I was kind of between the worlds and I didn't know I was 28 at the time, I'm 35 now. I didn't know if I would have another chance to live a life with um, plenty of energy, plenty of resources. And um, so I prayed and I said, um, okay, life, if I get another chance, I will just listen to the guidance and start to um, yeah, follow through with what my heart wants and not compromise anymore. So um, it was very hard for some time, but I actually feel like I'm fortunate that I had certain moments of crisis fairly early on in my life so that I then could make the corrections in my orientation and alignment that helped me to now be living my purpose. And, and so ultimately I'm grateful and I see those moments as um, important initiations along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 so wonderful. It's a gift for you to to in a way, you know, for these things to happen with you that early on in your life, like you said, and you really the the heartbreak and and these things that disabilitate us in certain ways really bring us into a closer relationship with ourselves and with Earth, don't they? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's something the trees show me uh, over and over again. Uh, in my work so I work as an artist but I also before I create anything um, I'm taking the time to really spend time with a tree that I want to create with so it's not a picture about a tree it's a picture that I create with the trees so um, I always have this this phrase where I say um, to the tree spirit that I'm working with is I'm offering you my eyes and my hands to express some of your creativity through me and then all of those things happen um, in writing and drawing and sketchbooks and uh, inner experiences and sometimes there's um, a healing that needs to happen when working with certain trees so they want me to be in my full power and my creativity and happiness and therefore they might have to bring something up that might be unexpected in the moment to say oh why is this coming into my awareness now yeah but really the way i understand it is that um, our gifts are often hidden inside our burdens so it's like uh, the burdens and the blessings they kind of belong together they're like the two sides of the same coin so when we mm. start asking ourselves um, why we have been given certain burdens or um, things that we need to address inside ourselves I find a day then become um, the treasure that can then inform us for the next step so I really try and walk with one one step on each side at the time yeah yeah, yeah. I, you know there is so there is so much truth to that um, in many ways you know one that you know, that's a portal into what else is in there that we need to know or understand better and calling us in the direction that we're meant to go. I love when you talk about how, you know, that you've been working for the trees and what I felt was it's a family business. And, you know, that it is, it is part of that ancestry too that you're going to be talking about you know that those that information those messages are there for us once we listen and um, you know create that sacred space for trees to be heard and for all of these gifts to to come to us and inform us the um the the agam came out of that right Le learning more about that so if you if you love to um i mean i would love you to explain more about that. I have always had a connection myself personally <laughs> to the Ogham and to the tree alphabet and to all of actually all of the Celtic arts, you know, since I'm so closely connected with my family, both sides being directly from Ireland, but nobody in my family actually brought that to me. It was, um, you know, we had already grown away from it or had been hidden away from it or whatever, you know, we 
um, all those records were lost in our family. I think the last remnant that I know of is my grandmother. You would read tea leaves and, uh, you know, the people would come from around the country to to have her divine through the tea leaves. And I'm sure there was many other things, but I'm, you know, like been drawn since I was a little girl. And um, so anyway, I would love to, that's why I'm so excited to also to have met you and to know that that's your definite focus. That's what you're really, really been learning and um, becoming, you know, so wise around the Agam. So would you please tell yeah. us how you started on that path? Yeah, so um, before I talk about the Ogham, I'll talk a little bit about the Druid dream itself. So the word um, Druid is made of two parts, Dru and Weed. Dru means tree or oak, and Weed means um, wisdom or knowledge. Mm -hmm. So the practice of Druidry is really a practice of tree wisdom or tree knowledge. Um, and that's a lifelong lifelong journey that um, just keeps unfolding so for me this started uh, at a fairly early age when i had a time when i was in boarding school for three years and um, i'm german speaking belgian i grew up close to the german border but i'm actually belgian Don't i have a belgian passport but culturally i'm much closer to germany so that time when i was in a boarding school there was a french speaking boarding school and I didn't know any French and his children didn't really like me that much. And I thought like, I'm a weird, strange person who speaks a different language. <laughs> so after school, I'd often go um, into the woods. And um, I just sit by a stream and listen to the water and lean against a tree. And I'd often just go um, leave the forest when it was already dark and just um, realize that I was um, having those conversations that I didn't know if other people were having the same experience or just didn't talk to anyone about it. So I carried on and then as a teenager, I felt a sense of lack of initiation in our culture. And I felt like, okay, I'm becoming a man, but I don't really know what that means. And no one seems to be like offering me something meaningful to make that transition. So yeah. again, I turned towards um, the forest and I started to go into the woods at night and spend the night outside by myself in the dark and just um, confront my fears of the darkness and my fear of the, the forest and psychology stands for the unconscious um, and that kind of um, all the hidden forces that are there and I really made a point to myself to go and expose myself to that and notice that actually I could find a sense of um, trust in nature and the uh, and the forest by having those experiences. And I still didn't know anything about druidry or tree wisdom in that sense, but um, this kind of sequence of initiations was given to me from nature. I just followed my intuition mm. and um, yeah, I thought for some reason I'm doing this. Um, and much, much later, actually, after I had Lyme disease, um, the first thing I did after recovering was to visit the oldest tree in Berlin, which is a 750-year-old oak tree by a lake. And uh, my prayer was, show me the door and I will walk through. Mm. And, uh, and I didn't realize that uh, actually the, the image of the door in the oak is one of the main symbols of the Druidic traditions. <laughs> so literally my prayer was answered when I realized that um, there's such a thing called Druidry and people have a language around it and words around it and practices that they do mm -hmm. that describes um, this level of nature connection of finding a spiritual meaning and understanding rooted in the landscape. So it's like the tree itself has um, has the roots and the branches and i felt when i was younger i was in india and i was doing all these uh, meditation techniques and um, kriya yoga and really like working with the prana and uh, my crown was so open i felt like um yeah i had all these kind of 
intense experiences. But then I came back from India and I realized that I'm like a tree without roots um, if I don't like turn my spirituality into the earth, into the land and into my body. And with the Druidic um, set of teachings, this all came together. So I could suddenly draw on this ability of communicating with the non-human world and the, and the trees and the elemental forces and the meditation practices and understand that they all belong together in, mm. in, um, in a system that now is called Druidry. I think it's immensely beautiful, partly because it's completely non-dogmatic. Yeah. And it's not like a, a, a revealed religion that's um, based on a book or like one particular teacher or one particular sacred space um, or temple where we recognize that all of nature is a temple. And um, instead of asking who is my teacher, the question for me is like, what can I learn from everyone, including the birds and the insects and the trees and the rivers? So it's a path of lifelong learning that I feel that I have already been on, but just to get the language and the words and the concepts to describe what is going on more effectively then enabled me to start to pass on some of the things that work for me to other people in the knowledge that we are all students of nature and um, our earth is the main teacher and then all the other beings that are can part of her, her children can then exchange their knowledge and wisdom and we can then grow together. Mm. And the, the, to come back to your question, so the, the, the Celtic tree organ is the um, oldest written language in the British Isles. It's um, usually been carved into stone or wood. And it's an alphabet in, in which each letter represents a tree. Um, but there were more organs. So I use a tree organ, but there were also organs for animals and rivers where each one of the letters represents um, something different. And the, the bards in, um, in the Druidic um, times would have used this as a, as a tool for memorization but also um, it becomes like a key to understand some of those deeper mysteries. And it's really, it's a reflection of the landscape. So there's trees in there, but there's also plants like the blackberry, for example. Mm -hmm. And so the organ is like, a, like a, a snapshot or a picture of the woodland culture and the woodland landscape mm -hmm. um, of that time. And it's evolved over the centuries, but I find that um, it's a very beautiful thing to use. And I haven't come up with um, it myself. So it's, it's been passed down for a long, long time. And many people are working with it in different ways. It can be used for writing, for um, divination, for um, all kinds of different purposes. But I find that, that my work is really to keep this tradition alive. There's a quote by Oscar Wilde that I really like, which is um, tradition is passing on the flame and not worshiping the ashes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I see that as part of my mission is to make sure that I can bridge the old ways with our new technology-based society that is going into a future where um, people do use websites and artwork. And, and I want some of that old wisdom to be accessible for people so that when people are looking for something that they can find ways into those streams of knowledge and tradition yeah. that unfortunately are not unbroken but mm. that many people are making an effort to um, revive and mm. reinvent. And uh, yeah, as I said, keep the flame alive and um, yeah, make sure this, this knowledge is accessible for people. Yes, yes. It's, I love that you are keeping the flame alive and that you found your calling and that you found the doorway. 
there's so many things that you you just explained that is a, a revelation really of a life and that searching that that knowing that, that inner knowing as a as a young man that there's supposed to be some type of uh, of initiation for me there's there's something that's not there and i know we all have felt that and we all have gone in different directions looking for it but it is something that's sorely missing in our society and the you know the, the, the beauty of what happened for you was that you discovered it without knowing it, that it was there, like without hearing ahead of time that it was there, you were already discovering it. It was already coming to you, you know, the, the trees and nature were, were already embracing you. And you, you know, there had to be a beginning in the very beginning, even for the Druid, and it seems similar to what must have been experienced at that point in time with that connection that you found with anyone telling you what you know more is there to find but it's wonderful that then when you found hey the you know this is in line with what i was already feeling that you decided that you were going to not only follow it but i think even the the, the larger piece for me is that you're wanting to share it and to keep it alive, keep, carry the flame and not worship the ashes. And, and I think that that is um, very profound, that, that piece alone, especially with everything that's going on in the world um, and with the divisiveness of, of religion and opinion and idea and, and you know all of the things that, that are dividing us that we uh, really need to find a way to come together and to protect the earth, to, to, to embrace the earth, to have our reverence back for the earth, to realize the preciousness of our earth that we have lost in the preciousness of each other in that, in that whole pattern um, where, you know, we cannot connect and we, can, we won't have, be able to really take care of the earth until we reconnect to each other. And so I feel I feel that that is, you know, a lot of what you're doing also by bringing it out into the world. And I've had uh, the enjoyment of coming to a couple of your workshops and I wasn't able to make as many as I wanted to, um, but they're beautiful um, for each tree and you, you hold an open space really in a very sacred way and you're listening very deeply. And you, and as everybody knows right now from this call, your voice is also grounding and, you know, bringing us into the roots of the trees. And I appreciate all of the, you know, all of these nuances of, of how you are doing, you're really embodying um, the work. And, and also we're gonna go to look at some of your gorgeous artwork, but I would, I would like to know where it came to you that you wanted to start to create the visuals for this? Was it mainly because you wanted to bring it to the world and you felt that it needed to be painted? Or was there a specific moment when you said, I, you know, I have to, to, to paint? Mm. So, um, yeah, something I love about the trees, um, is how embodied they are. So um, when we turn towards spirituality, there's um, all these different ways of connecting, right? So some people connect more with like um, angelic realms or power animals. And um, often that can be a bit difficult for people to start if you, if, if you want to connect with, an, with the angelic realms, for example, um, it's more of an internal thing, right? And even with the animal spirits, like animals usually run away from us when we want to connect with them. Mm -hmm. But the trees, they're so embodied and they're so reliable in the sense that we know they're there in their body. And if we have a tree that we love, we can go and see it and it's very likely to be there in 10 years. It might, might even still be there in a hundred years. Hopefully. And it will be in exactly the same location. Yeah. So um, that's something I find is um, 
because the whole tree planting thing has become so big and many people recognize that the tree of life has been an ancient symbol in almost every religion mm. and that uh, there's now all this uh, climate change um, awareness growing and people talk about trees more in the practical side of the of the tree planting and so they kind of bridge really the practical and the spiritual and so for me the the artwork is um is another way of expressing this bridge between having something that's visible that represents more than the visible world that kind of bridges the visible and the invisible world mm -hmm. so that we can um, communicate something that is um, like a picture says, says more than a thousand words so that, that people get a feeling from a picture and then maybe they feel inclined to learn more about it mm -hmm. and some people who look at the at the pictures like the old picture for example come from a very scientific background and they might feel something different than someone who's coming from a more um, spiritual background and uh, I wanted to have something that is making a clear statement for um, the energy of the trees that is uh, full of rich like symbolism and um, story as well that goes back to ancestral um, heritage really. Yeah. But uh, the first tree banner, um, I was actually about to go on a journey with a teenager that I guided one-to-one -one for two months as a social worker and I took him on a nature connection um, adventure which was an alternative for him going into juvenile mm. and um, I only had four or five days left before going on this um, bigger project uh, which was 24 7 so i wasn't able to create anything during that time and my friend uh, david who um who is an amazing brother of mine he contacted me and he said um, um my partner and i were offering an oak retreat and uh, there's going to be people working with oak for four days and we want to have something in the space that brings the energy of the oak and i said um okay after five days um, let's do this. And so I opened the ceremonial space um, with my wheel of the year, altar cloth, and uh, drawing on the different techniques and resources from my trainings. And I just um, offered my creativity to the oak tree and asked for the oak to show something of its own energy signature through the artwork. And I literally didn't stop for like three, four days. I was just drawing and drawing and drawing and just having little sips of water and snacks in between. And after four days, I just look at the picture and I thought, wow, I didn't expect this to be the outcome. And then I sent it off to David, who then got it printed for the retreat. And, and, and I didn't know at that point that I would be embarking on a whole journey. Mm -hmm. that was three years ago or two and a half years ago mm -hmm. and uh, so the organ has 25 trees in it trees and plants and i've done 13 pictures so far but the oak tree was the first one that was two and a half years ago and i'm committed to illustrating all 25 and create a whole library of um, artwork guided mm -hmm. meditations um, powerpoint presentations which have the botanical and mythological aspects of each one of the trees combined mm -hmm. but to create like a real uh, like a library of yeah. tree wisdom or of druidic wisdom um, to have that accessible for people to either focus on individual trees or understand the whole of the forest as a community where they can go deeper into each one of those um, um, aspects so yeah there was like a seed being planted uh, from that request from my friends to create something for them, which then sparked off a journey that I'm in at the moment, which will take at least another two or three years to complete. But um, with the completion of the 12th picture, I knew, okay, I can make a calendar now. Right, right. Yeah. People like, because um of that being quite a deeper commitment where i tune into each one of the trees messages and i and i'm it's not just book knowledge it's uh, my personal experience first 
that are then put into uh, a context of other people's experiences and book references as a kind of second step. So I feel like some of the insights that are being given to me now are very relevant to like 21st century, mm -hmm. like the time that we are in now, the people who wrote about this 30, 40 years ago, they might not have got the same messages. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure I bring not just like a copy of something old, but like an actual upgraded version that is uh, very relevant for where we are. Mm. Um, and some people will like the artwork and some people will like the workshops and some people will like both. And um, yeah, so that's my bigger um, commitment. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a. Uh, I love that you're doing that an updated version and bringing it into the relevancy of right now. And that's um, something I didn't know that you were uh, bringing in. And I really um, appreciate that because it's not just a historical look, but there's something new that we need to pay attention to, and some new messages that are coming through. Your artwork is beautiful, and I'm going to start showing that in one minute. The the one thing I also wanted to ask you, it just came to me now, that I know that the you know that the algum is also um, has been used as an astrological form as well. Yeah. That people who are born in certain times of the year, not each month, but there's sort of, you know, uh, half of one month and half of the other is, has the energy of a certain tree. And I wanted to ask you, what is yours? And how do you think that it relates to your work? And what you're called to do? Yeah. So um, as far as I'm aware, like the, the Celtic tree calendar that goes back to Robert Graves, who wrote about it in his book, The White Goddess, I think it's called, mm. um, in the mid 20th century. So uh, for me, like the calendar with which I work is literally the calendar of the seasonal wheel of the year. And uh, I don't necessarily place one tree in each month. Uh, I am born in April, so I feel like I have a strong connection with the with the birch tree and the kind of sense of like the rising of the of the sap and that kind of spring energy. Um, but yeah, I don't use the calendar by Robert Graves, um, but I am aware of it. And um, but the way I use the, the the trees in the sequence of the year is that I just pay attention to the landscape. And so if the rowan berries are there and shining at me with their bright red berries, then I know this is the time of the rowan tree. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it might be a bit earlier in the year, sometimes a bit later. Um, like this year in, in England was particularly bad for the apple trees. Um, the harvest isn't good because there's been a lot of rain. Uh, interestingly, we're going to be working with apples soon. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I place the apple tree in this kind of September, October time of the year is um, because of all the kind of traditional customs around the harvesting of the apples and the making of cider and cider vinegars and pressing the apple to make juice. And um, it's like a real rich and a heritage of folklore and songs around this um, time of the year where people would have gone into the orchards and celebrated the apples. Mm. But it doesn't mean that when the apple is blossoming earlier in the year, maybe around May, that um, I won't necessarily include it at that point too. So, mm -hmm. and a lot of trees have a kind of two or three different times in the year where they really um, step forward Let's say the hawthorn has a white blossom in, around Beltane, um, beginning of May, and then the red berries at this time of the year. So there's this kind of um, calendar that's quite complex and um, yeah. Yeah, okay. I hope that answers the question. You no, know, it it does. It does because you you know the astrological. There there is a few different ways of looking at the the agam, and the astrological is not something that you feel um, particularly drawn to. And I 
I also hear the complicated pieces of this and how, you know, the tree progresses during the year. And I mean, they're with us all year long, but um, I love, you know, that you're looking at them in certain ways as their growth is happening or their fruiting is happening, you know, in sequence with, you know, of course, Holly, you know, in, in uh, the Yule time and, and all of this, but let's, let's look at your work. How, now, how big are these pieces usually? I'm going to share the screen. How big is your artwork? First, we're going to look at your yurt. This is what you're in right now, what you built with your, your own bare hands, right? Yeah. And it, it's covered with a, you have a kind of a cover on it? Yeah, it's a, it's a canvas and the wood is mainly ash. Mm that Dora's ash also. And this is, this. these are trees that fell and you used and cut and, and built every piece of it by hand, right? So, um, the wood actually, because of the ash dieback, a lot of ash trees have to be cut um, here in the UK. So that means a lot of the ash is also available as a building material and as firewood. Um, and yeah, I started, I worked with someone more experienced, he had, built I think 12 yards and he's in his 60s so it was a really beautiful um, uh, collaboration and he did most of the canvas work where I focused a bit more on the woodwork yeah yeah the canvas looks particularly difficult and, and uh, intricate like how you know it, to seal the water out we also had the same problems here in the U.S. with the ash bore that a lot of our ash trees um, died and there are um, people here, this was already uh, in 2009, I know it's still happening a little bit, but uh, who made furniture and a lot of different um, artisans used the ash uh, also to create pieces like that. I, I, I can imagine you walking around there, it's beautiful. So here is the first piece that you ever actually put out for the public, is that right? Yeah, so... Um... During my time of training with a Druidic um, tradition, I first started off with a Druid college, which was a three year long apprenticeship. And then um, I later on started to train with the Order of Bards of Wits and Druids as well. But this was at the beginning of my um, studies. I wanted to have an altar cloth that I can um, just take to places outside and just fold it and um, carried around with me. So I created this design, um, which is a medicine wheel, which has the four directions, the four elements, some of the animals and trees that I feel connected to. And also there's the runes and the tree organ on there in the inner circles, um, which are to me are two ancestral languages that are both connected to trees. Mm. Before I mentioned the organ and the runes are said to be discovered by Odin who hang who hung himself from the world tree upside down, staring into the branches. And then the runes are revealed to him in the branching patterns of the forest seen upside down. So there's um, these two languages, more from the Germanic and more from the Celtic um, people, were both connected to trees. So I see them as ancestral tree languages. And I combined all of this into like a design for an altar cloth and I made it for myself. And then um, I was really happy to have this new tool that I could carry around and use. And then a friend of mine saw it and went, oh, can I, can I have one of those? And yeah. then I was like, well, okay, well, now that it's there, I have uh, a gift that I can share and uh, also a responsibility to make it available to people mm. who feel that resonance and to want to work with this um, template. Yeah, and you have one there with you, don't you? Yeah, so this is what it looks like. Uh, I don't know if you, if you can see this or now, but... Um, yeah, it's big. Uh, so this is... Um, it's printed on organic cotton, so... All of, my, um, all of my art is done by um, eco-printing companies who specialize in having... Awesome. ...really high-quality materials. Yeah. So this is how it kind of folds into a little package that I can then carry around. And when I am somewhere and I want to 
create a beautiful space for myself. Mm -hmm. I can then put a cloth on the ground and like decorate it with things that I find and stones and candles yeah. and a bowl of water. Mm. And this design, I also have a poster that gives a bit more um, information about it on my Etsy page. Yeah. And this is really how I started selling things on Etsy because I felt this, um, I have something that people want and need and there's, um, uh, yeah, the sense of responsibility of bringing something to my community. Yes. So yeah. um, hundreds of people are working with this uh, design like all over the world and Europe in Australia and also in the United States. Um, yeah. Yes, good, good job. <laughs> and it just came, it came from your own desire to create a sacred space when you went into the woods. And I just, I love where everything you've done, you've done has been born from that place of sacred, sacredness that, oh, somebody else wants it too. And, you know, rather than creating something with, the idea of you know somebody else wanting to purchase it i i really love the um the sacred witness with which it was born and birthed into the world and i want to get one of these i i have a few of your things but i really would like to have a piece that i could bring out that is exactly like this out into the woods so you'll be seeing me on there I am. Um, I'm just looking really closely at it. It's um, got so much information on there. Let's go to the next one. So this yeah. I'm going to a little bigger if I can. Just, just to add what um, what you just said. Like for me, what's very beautiful in the last years to be part of um, Three Sisters mm -hmm. is that um, I kind of managed to close uh, a loop when. Um, because I'm able to donate three sisters for everything I sell on Etsy. Yeah. Um, I feel that the, the inspiration that I receive from the forest mm. is then coming out and being gifted to the community who then are able to give back to me and also to the trees in the forest. Yes, yes. You that's, close a, that's the model that I see everywhere in nature that um, Mm -hmm. that all those feedback loops and those cycles of nourishment they're all cyclical and yeah. nothing gets lost and um, for a long time i didn't want to create anything because i felt very bad i felt like yeah uh, i can't i can't i don't want to create a piece of art about trees that is printed on a dead tree right doesn't make any sense. yeah and when i meditated on this for for a long time um, I felt like the earth and the trees were telling me, like from all the people who use paper, like, please go and do it. You've got our blessings because mm -hmm. um, you're going to make it beautiful and you're going to use those resources in a way that brings the awareness that is necessary. Yeah. Those things. And then by finding the eco printing companies who work with plant based inks and recycled papers and uh, to donate to Tree Sisters. There's a way of, for me of saying, okay, I want to do this with as much integrity as I can possibly do this yeah. while still running a business. But from this foundation that is really putting the heart into the center. So yeah. that's why I work with this working title of Forest Heart. Yes. Um, because yeah. if we have to we have to make our heart print as well as our footprint and be aware of of that cycle like you said that nothing is coming from nowhere and nothing is going to nowhere it's all, everything's going somewhere and everything's coming from somewhere and i you know i would like to talk to to the printer you know also about um you know becoming you know part of the tree sister community because they're there are a lot of artists that I work with that, you know, are, it's not that easy to find still after all these years, it's still difficult to find, you know, really good printers that do the or on organic material as well as, you know, the ink. That's, you know, even more difficult sometimes to find the toxic free ink, you know, that goes back into our waste. and. This looks beautifully done. The ones that I have are really beautiful. I mean, there's almost a, um, a more of a beauty to the paper. Also, the um, 
the um, you know or organic um, materials because I don't know there's a richness to it or maybe it's just in my mind when I know that it is um, that no, way. I think, I think you're right. I mean the poster we've got there that's a tree organ poster, and this is uh, not the same poster but it's an example of the size. That's like a A3 poster and it's got a beautiful kind of it's like a professional print so it has this kind of quality to it but also it has a more of a natural feel that um, yeah. a lot of prints of things that have a, a kind of um, a more like sealed off and there's a sense of um, that's it uh, but this kind of paper it's fairly close to like um, yeah it's still some something man-made but it does feel a bit more natural yeah no it's it's uh it's necessary too because the paper you know the paper industry is is a huge one um so it's really important to to look at that so i appreciate that very much um but let's let's come back to your so this is explain what you know with the, how this is uh, how you're showing this so on this picture it's um this is what i call infographic so it's um I love doing infographics because they combine a beautifully visually arranged piece of art that also has text and information that can be read and understood with the mind. So yeah. like a way of combining the kind of the useful and the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And um, I've got a, a whole series. I've got one on the Wheel of the Year and the Tree of Life and the Foraging Calendar and the Tree Organ. And one about the moon phases as well. Yeah, I have the so moon. What I'm doing with all those posters is um, is to give people an overview that then allows you to go into detail. So whenever I'm learning something, I want to know how everything fits together. Mm -hmm. and then I can go into detail knowing that I can always come back to the overview. Yeah. Once I know where a piece of information fits into the bigger picture, then I can kind of get lost in detail uh, and enjoy that too. But I'm a visual learner and I'm an overview um, person. I love mapping, for example, um, and I love to kind of lean back and be able to take it in. So here's yeah. uh, what I described earlier, this um, oldest language in the British Isles that would have been carved into stone and wood. Mm -hmm. And these are the symbols. So you see all the different letters of the alphabet. Uh, are represented on there and then the tree and then the original name in, in um, the Gaelic um, language mm -hmm. and um, they're grouped into four groups there's a fifth group which is a later edition which um, just for design purposes I didn't include but these are like the 20 traditional ones mm -hmm. and then in the middle there's um, uh, an old symbol where they can be arranged in a circular pattern as well and then they give a little bit of information on both sides mm -hmm. to then really spark off people's curiosity to then go and learn in their own way. Yeah. And I find that compared to a book, like a book, I love books, I have many books, but they kind of sit on the shelf a lot of the time. Yes. And, um, and the picture can be present in a space in a different way. So if I have the poster hanging on my wall, then I might just be drinking a cup of tea and I just look at the poster and I think like, Oh, today I'm I'm going to pay some attention to my relationship with the trees. Yeah, and I might just remember one of them being particularly strong at the moment. Mm -hmm. I love uh, that. I might not have necessarily taken a book off my shelf and read um, the whole yeah. chapter, but that kind of quick. Oh yeah, right. This is something I'm learning about, and it's kind of anchoring something for me by having it in a space. Yeah, the present, the constant presence, like you, like you spoke of actually about the trees themselves that, you know, they don't run away from us or, you know, that their, their presence is, is always felt that, you know, they're always there and, you know, unlike the books that are, you know, on the shelf, but, you know, it's, we see the, the spine of the book or maybe the face of the book, but we don't always see in them. And I, I love the infographic and the way that you describe the importance of it. I'm going to move on to some of the work here. So this is the, this is the oak and I'm going to see if I can um, zoom in a little bit, but the 
Oak stands for sovereignty, truth, and trust. Yeah, amongst many other things. But the actual banner is the picture on the right. So um, yeah. the original picture has like, um, here's a small version of this print. Um, and I can print this up to like two meters in height, like uh, they can be printed on like big wall hangs. But this is the actual um, size of it, mm -hmm. um, which I'm also developing into a card deck, which is going to have um, those. Oh, cards. great. I was going to ask you about that. And how big was this original piece? So the original piece is um, maybe 70 centimeters long. I don't know how to convert it into different units. Seven meters, you said? Yeah, seven, seven centimeters um, from 35. That's, uh, but when I get them printed, they're like a meter long. So that's, um, I could actually show you one. I'm just gonna yeah, that, that would be great. Yeah. So um, here's, a, here's a banner that I'm working on at the moment that goes out to someone who ordered this. Oh, it's so, yeah, it's so big. So it's like four feet, if we're looking at uh, the feet, four feet tall. It's yeah. beautiful, absolutely. I love how long they are. Um, it, show, it feels like a tree, you know, that they, yeah. that you have. And yeah. here, here's the one for the birch, right? Yeah, that's, that's the picture just showed you. And then they kind of come like this, they kind of roll, there's a kind of, again, it's organic cotton candles. It's like hundred percent candles. Yeah, yeah. And be used to create ceremonial space, really. That's right. why I want for them to be um, you or how, the way I imagine them being used by people is um, it's really for um, yeah ceremonial space and for people to connect and build their relationships and have something almost like totemic or like um, tribal in the sense that it kind of reflects um, a relationship to one of our allies. And I know many people who work with trees as their, as their close um, ally. Yes. Uh, as well as animals and mountains and um, mm -hmm. many and other Watercolor on, the, on this one when you did the original or? So this one is done with, it started off in pencil and then it's colored in ink and then it's scanned and digitally colored. And then I weave in layers of photography and um, the watercolor comes in with a different style of, uh, of pictures. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I include the Celtic knotwork and uh, a little bit of symbolism like the fly Garrick, for example. Yeah. Which is nice to go um, close to the birch. Mm -hmm. Really, really cool. Okay. And the birch stands. So I don't want to go by without honoring the birch for it stands for cleansing birth and new beginnings mm. and, and that's really what's happening right now i feel in the world mm. a lot of things need needing to be cleansed and uh, a lot of things being birthed and and new beginnings i i like to think of it that way yeah yeah exactly and that's where the work with the trees becomes very practical as well yeah, I don't see it as a way of escaping with what's going on in the world. On the contrary, it's like, um, okay, all the things are going on and um, and then we're drawing on support and strength. So I always say to people, um, if you had a conversation with one of your ancestors who grew up in the Northern Hemisphere where there are birch trees and you show any one of your ancestors from the last 50,000 years a birch leaf, every single one of them will recognize it and say, oh yeah, that's a birch. And yeah. I, I've, I've connected to this tree in my lifetime. And, mm -hmm. um, and so it becomes very practical when we do need to go through a process of cleansing and rejuvenation and new beginnings, then we can draw on those, uh, kind of call on those allies and build those relationships. Yes, the it's trees it's, have been our teachers for thousands of years, so yeah, and um, they are in that role for us as humanity of holding a space for us. So yeah, as you can tell, I'm passionate about this. <laughs> we we do we do we we you know sometimes we we go around with our you know with our heads down, not realizing that we have allies, you know, in the trees, and in many many 
you know, beings in nature. And it's so important. I, I heard someone say the other day that caught my attention. And they said there were a lot of angels out of this, out of work, out of business, because people aren't realizing that our angels are with us always and that they want to be there and support us. And I feel the same. Well, I know the same is true for the trees and for nature. So, you know, they're, they're just waiting for us and um, to reach out to them. So the willow, is um, for some reason, I think, uh, you know, it draws me in the most. Uh, the willow stands for soothing, fluidity, and emotional intelligence. This is just so beautiful, the color, the colors and everything. I, I could just lose myself in it, absolutely gorgeous. And, you know, how you have the bees and the, the, the you know, the other creatures that, that are, you know, also part of you know, the whole system that, you know, the trees are an ecosystem on their own, a lot of life within each tree and, you know, all, all sorts of connectedness going on there, but also, you know, with the water and the animals and, and even the music you have, the, with the, the way the harps made with, um, where the harps originally made with willow or something. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And also, um, yeah, like this particular harp, it's an actual um, design from a harp that survived um, in the island. Um, and you know, the, the uh, drink company Guinness, like the Guinness beer, they yeah. have the same harp as the, as the logo because it's such an old harp, it's called the Trinity College Harp. Yeah. But, um, and that one was made out of willow. And so I wanted to incorporate that connection between the bards who would be um, carrying their harps uh, as like living beings and have this relationship um, to um, the mm. muse of inspiration and that fluidity and that um, yeah. ability to play the harp as a kind of soothing um, uh, instrument that has very similar qualities so that kind of watery, soothing, kind of dreamy. Yeah. So everything that goes into those pictures is there for a reason. Yeah, um, absolutely. Like the heron, for example. Um, yeah, they carry, they, you said how they carry the harps with them as a living being. That yeah. really caught my attention when you, um, when you said that. And yeah, I'm sure that all, you know, each and every piece is um, so thought out and, you know, symbolic. And so, you know, so much to be learned from each and every one. And of course, that's what you, what you teach. And here's another um, with the cauldron. Mm -hmm. And ivy, right? Yeah, there's ivy on there, there's some dandelion on there, some nettle. So I created this cloth when I was a bit further into my training where I'm um, working, I, I like foraging plants. And so mm -hmm. I make my own teas and tinctures and um, smudge mixes. Yeah, of course you do. And so I wanted to have something like a, a piece of uh, an altar cloth where I can keep the things that I prepare so they don't just stand somewhere on a shelf or in the kitchen. Oh. I, I think if a tincture, uh, let's say it takes like uh, six months for it to sit in, in the alcohol to extract the um, contents. Yeah. Then whatever, wherever this um, mixture is standing is also important. Yes, I, I love have that. something that uh, that I can use for my work with the herbs to um, yeah. have like, like a plant medicine uh, cauldron type space. Yes, it's such a beautiful idea. It's a again, you're bringing in the sacredness of each thing that you do, and create you know bringing the visual together, the intention and the symbols and you know all, all the whatever tinctures and and things that you're making are going to soak that all up of course right and become more powerful i love the little bubbles actually some <laughs> <laughs> um all right let's yeah. see okay here we go with this one mm. yeah that's an example of a watercolor picture okay uh, that's done with uh, ink pen and then colors and watercolors yeah. Um, so uh, where I live, it's on the edge of Dartmoor, and there's a lot of, um, yeah, ancestral 
uh, wisdom in the land from the last four, five, six thousand years. And um, I went to drum birthing workshop on Dartmoor with uh, a couple called Carolyn uh, Hillier and Nigel Sean. And they have a roundhouse on Dartmoor that they have built. And um, we did this beautiful like, drum birthing ceremony. Um, and then I came back home and this picture came from um, integrating and really honoring that experience they had of, um, and the deer is there because the drum is made from deer skin. Okay, okay, yeah. A pile of rocks up there, that's a very typical thing to see in the Dartmoor landscape. They're called the tools, they're the old bits of granite that were inside old mountains, but the whole mountain got eroded. And those big chunks of granite are kind of lying on top of the hills. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yes, that's like a more of a, yeah, like personal piece that reflects something that um, mm -hmm. in, in the Druidic tradition we work a lot with the Arwen, which is uh, translated as inspiration or flowing spirit or flowing inspiration. Flowing spirit, yeah. Um, so this is an example of I do something and I make something, and there's a craft. And there's a place and there was song and story and ritual mm -hmm. and then that flowing spirit of inspiration i then put this into a piece of art which is another expression of that stream of um inspiration Absolutely. Then someone might see the picture and maybe write a poem about it Absolutely. Or, um, and that's how the inspiration kind of transcends time and space and travels in uh, very interesting ways yeah. Let's let's put that out to everyone who's watching that anyone who would like to write a poem or a few lines from any of these pieces um, to to do to go ahead and do that. It, it feels to, to me that each piece that we're looking at is, you know, like an entire workshop. There's so much to be to be learned in each one. And I'm I just wanted to mention while while I've thought that is that I'm going to be I've invited you to come to the creative journey um, that we do uh, liberating our creative voice for Earth and you've agreed and so you're going to come and we're going to work that out real soon and share a bit of your wisdom and you know actually be with some people live that can talk to you and. And we can all experience things together. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll tune into writing a poem together that day, or something along those lines. Through, um, through this cycle of creativity that it feels like you're talking about through the trees. This yeah. one is so colorful. It's different. It feels different than your other work. Yeah, and um, yeah, just to add to what you're saying about um, the creative work. I would love to do that, and also. Uh, the interactive spaces, I really enjoy them as well. Like, um, yeah. yeah, and this is a good example. This piece of art, because that's a collaboration with someone, um, or it's more of a commission for someone who has been working with the dragon energies for more than twenty years. And she is in Australia, and she sat in her meditation one morning, and she didn't know me very well. She just added me on Facebook, but she had this. Um, experience in her meditation where the dragons were saying and this guy Yannick in England he has to create a, this altar cloth for our work and uh, mm. just get in touch with him yeah and I just come back from Wales last year from a pilgrimage where for the first time in my life I had like an embodied experience of dragon oh. energy and then, and then knew the dragon is not the kind of Ex we're not expected to kind of see them as kind of full-blown vision of a dragon, but they're more something energetic that we can feel in our bodies. It's kind of mm -hmm. circulating through us as mm -hmm. we're tuning into the landscape. And I've had this experience and literally a month later, she then gave me a call and asked me to, um, to create this piece. Uh -huh. and, I asked, and then I said to her, um, uh, she, and then she revealed to me that her work with the dragons had started in Wales many, many oh. years ago. <laughs> so there was, and then we knew that the dragons of Wales had kind of matched us up in this kind of really uh, strange mm -hmm. way. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. So in this picture, you see the rainbow serpent in the lower right mm -hmm. corner, which is yeah. uh, the yeah. rainbow serpent. Quetzalcoatl from Mexico on the left, the lower corner. Okay. And the Welsh dragons um, yeah. dragon on the top left corner. Yeah. And the Chinese dragon on the top right corner. Yes. And this is the idea that um, this dragon energy has been recognized all over the planet. Yes. This piece is really for people who want to be working with dragon energy, ley lines, earth energies. Yeah. Um, and call on this more like global consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's partly why this picture looks a bit different as well, because yeah. a lot of what I do is very embedded in the landscape that I live in. Yes. And this is one of the times when someone um, commissioned something that I also want to do, which has more of a global um, feel to it and a bit more of a yeah, kind of broader, more yeah. colorful, more diverse um, approach. Yeah. Yeah, and I love how you've adapted to that. I mean, you really, you can feel the different areas in the planet, you know, you can feel the different expressions in the from the different um, regions of the world. Like, so it's not just, you know, your work. So I love how you can adapt. I mean, this is still your work, but I mean, you know, not the one that you usually do. You opened up and set the intentions to receive this uh, this global um, expression and the one thing I just want to mention is uh, quite a while back I I led a workshop for um, to open up creativity and it was called releasing the creative dragon so okay. yeah so there, there's a lot inside of everything we're doing at this time um, this is the last picture, um, but it's also like along the same line of commissioned work. And um, the, the last one was commissioned, as you said, and, and this one was too, correctly? Correct? Yes, that's a friend of mine who um, is a, a woman in her 60s who's working um, with groups and she wants to have a drum with a Celtic knot work and the four elements in her two totem animals, the bear and the wolf, mm. and this kind of triple goddess symbol in the middle. Um, and she described to me um, what she wanted. She also feels connected to the birch tree, which is there on the frame with the leaves. And um, yeah, so I was able to create this for her. And I think that's one of my gifts is to make things visible. I usually the thing that people say when they see what I create for them is to say, wow, this is more than I could have imagined. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly why people work with me because I have this ability to tune in and receive the, the pictures um, from like the deeper, deeper realm of imagination. Yeah. And it's almost like a, this is like an ability that I have developed in nature, but it's um, applies to so many things. It's um, and I think we all have this. It's uh, it's almost like giving a phone call. Like once you know which number to dial, like which energy we want to tune into, mm -hmm. then the rest is really just to listen and I often find like I'm doodling whilst I'm having a phone call. So I'm there on the phone with an oak tree, like metaphorically speaking. Right. And I'm just doodling and like half my attention is like listening to what the tree is communicating and half my attention is on the page. So it doesn't actually matter that much what I'm creating as long as I know where, what I'm tuning into. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's also uh, something that I'm very selective about. So um, yeah, um, like more than half of the commissions that are being offered to me um, I'm saying no to, or I'm forwarding to them to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, just because I, ha I hold quite a strong commitment to the work that I'm doing. Yeah. And also I want to make sure that um, this process of channeling is also in alignment with where I'm at in my personal journey. Right, right. Because that's where my strongest uh, interest is. Because that's what's alive for me at the time, matches something that's alive for someone else matches something that's alive in the collective yeah. and then I feel I can I can really uh, give my best uh, instead of doing things just for as a job or just for money which I could do but haven't done for some years 
Um, yeah. And I find that the more I say, I keep that alignment and that commitment also the more um, like my guides and the beings that are working with me are then matching me up with the things yeah. that I'm really supposed to be doing. Yeah, that's a, that's a, my, my, my last question for you was actually what advice, you know, that or, you know, wisdom that we do would like to share with everybody around um, nature and creativity. But I think you actually just did. I mean, I'll give you the opportunity again, but, you know, I took it in because, you know, the things that we're putting our, our energies into, like that is a choice from our spirit. It's a choice of, you know, this valuable energy that we have. And, you know, you live, you know, basically off the grid. I mean, there's very, very little that we actually need, you know, that we have become a, a society of consumers and, and um, we, you know, th uh, as many of us who can realize that it's, it's not about how much we can gain, but it's, how, you know, how much we can gain monetarily, but how much we can recognize the abundance that's already there. Um, and, you know, be, love and care for and protect and be in reciprocity, be in a right relationship with the planet and each other is actually where all the value is that, that, that we um, are looking for in all the wrong places, as they say. And, you know, that is, um, I will give you an opportunity to give um, another tidbit of wisdom, but I, I took that as, as that, you know, that you're, you're holding a very sacred, your work in a very sacred way that you're not just going to drivel it off just in order to get money or to get other things or objects. Um, but you're actually thinking about it as a, as an actual gift that, you're dispersing into the world with uh, intentions and i think that's what makes it would make it way more powerful you know to hold that peace that, that in your you know that you've created the energy that's imbued in it you know from the tinctures you make to your artwork you know or just being in your presence today that you know that is felt in in what you're in uh, everything that you're that you're doing it's felt that um you just don't drivel it away at all i appreciate that but please um share if you have something other piece of wisdom which i'm sure you have plenty of it's something just to give every you know every everybody on this call yeah thank you for this beautiful reflection um so when I work with people, which I do a lot in workshops and I do one-to-one -one sessions for people as well, and they could be more on the spiritual side and more on the creative side, I, um, I firmly believe that we all have our own unique talents and gifts and they're not going to be uh, what someone else is doing, but even though we can get inspired by many different um, sources and places and people i think what i found in myself in my own journey is to really trust what is coming through and not to compromise and at the beginning when i started off uh, working as a self-employed self-taught artist that wasn't easy but i said to myself i'm doing one day a week focus on my creativity and whatever money I need to earn that has to be done within four days a week and and I, so this way I knew that I'm investing in something that feels like my deeper purpose mm -hmm. even though I couldn't financially sustain myself with it from the first day right. and even now I think I have much less money than people who work full-time but also to find ways of like seeing values in different in different ways and finding like simplicity and re-evaluating in a sense of what our values are how much we truly need yeah and so if i need maybe a bit less and i can carve out some more time then suddenly i'm doing two days a week focus on my purpose and my creativity 
And that doesn't always mean that I'm just sitting there drawing. It could be on some time. It might be going out for a long walk or it might be sitting with a tree, all those other things that are making this um, alive. Right. And so what I encourage people to do is to find their own um, approach. And most people know, most people say, well, I really love doing this. And then I kind of got into this thing and then, and then I got all of those obligations that have started piling up and they are sometimes hard to escape and there's no point um, mm -hmm. trying to escape from that place of escapism. Yeah. But I think it's like gradually and slowly turning towards the things that we love mm. and, and not to compromise because that's something I realized early on, there's no guarantee for us to get 85 years of healthy, beautiful, yeah. Abundant lifetime ahead of us, or um, yeah. Yeah. and that's something that I treasure is that lesson of impermanence and uh, mortality, mm. which is uh, such a beautiful foundation. That trees, like a yew tree, for example, mm. are very good at helping us to integrate. So, from that foundation, I just encourage people to play a bit more, to bring their inner child out a bit more. Mm to make things that if they don't like them, they, they know that they can burn and destroy them in the end. Or it doesn't have to be very um, like serious all the time. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and Adam, the of <laughs> Adam, enjoy the process, enjoy the value and enjoy each and every moment that we have. Um, you, it's a, a no compromise to your um, creative voice and to your enjoyment of this life because it, it's a gift every moment right and yeah. you mentioned the yew tree so that's kind of a good lead-in because the next inter interview I'm going to be doing is with Hilder Pascal who actually works with the yew tree and um, so I'll share more about you with each other probably also that um, this has been a, a beautiful interview an interview of of you Yannick and I know we could do many more and I'm looking forward to you joining the you know coming in and sharing with the creative journey uh, live with us and having that interaction like it's with others and um, you know so they can all share what I'm feeling right now and I hope everybody really enjoyed um, I know everybody really enjoyed this and there'll be lots of information below with all kinds of goodies to learn more about Yannick's work. And I really appreciate and I'm so grateful for everything you do and, and that you're my friend and that you're a tree brother. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much and to everyone who has been listening. And uh, yeah, many, many blessings to you and to the work you're doing and the tree sisters work represents something really needed and of the future and really leading the way in that uh, new paradigm so thank you thank you thank you everybody we'll see you next time